this it, there we go all right disclaimer at the beginning of this presentation this is in no way a complete history of hip-hop it's a 50 year old art form i'm gonna leave things out <laughs> i'm going to not have the time and the ability to be able to talk about everything that's happened all the step, um, every step of the way so my apologies in advance if i forget any anyone that you love any artists that you enjoy leaving on any names and elements that you may know i'm not going to talk about dance that much i'm not going to talk about graffiti or some of the other pillars of hip-hop i really want to focus more on the music and how much it's changed the technology and we're going to have a little quiz at the end to talk about culture to see what you might know about hip-hop and what you might have taken for granted but actually know about Okay, so we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to go back to 1950s and 60s Bronx, New York. So anyone? <laughs> I see. <woo> <laughs> um, any fans of Bronx, New York? Any Yankee fans? <laughs> all right. Yeah, some Yankee fans. So you know all about the Bronx. Great. So a little bit of history of the Bronx. The Bronx and the, actually the 1970s are what? In hip hop, we call the South South Bronx. Okay, so and the cross ex, the cross Bronx Expressway, which we've all driven. If you've driven from Connecticut on I ninety five or eighty seven going to the George Washington Bridge, you have crossed this expressway. Okay, it's a mess, <laughs> just to let you know. But it's a, in a, a mess in a different way that I'm going to talk about. Okay, but the Bronx in the nineteen fifties. In 1960s, and here's a little map for you for a little geography. For those of you geography buffs, we have Bronx on top and Manhattan, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens. JFK gets its own part of the map because it's huge. But um, the Bronx is one of the five boroughs of New York. And in the 1940s and 50s was a collection of neighborhoods with immigrants of Irish, Jewish, and Italian descent. And at the arrival of African-American and Puerto Rican um, residents, immigrants, Many white residents fled to the outer suburbs, going into Westchester County and other areas of Queens, or into other surrounding tenements. Many Black and Hispanic residents were forced to move to the south end of the borough, while the northern inside enjoyed the spoils of discrimination, redlining. Um, the neighborhood started to get a little neglected. Enter, let's see, and I, I had some pictures here, some really kind of cool pictures of you know the trolley cars in the 40s and 50s in the bronx i had to add this one rachel <laughs> little bronx traveling library and all the kids with their satchels <laughs> so the bronx was really a very vibrant place at the time but as the great migration um from the 40s and 50s and 60s became um pre prevalent uh, prevalent there were there were a lot more discriminatory practices okay and here's a little shopping center. There was a cool picture of Woolworths, if you guys remember Woolworths at all, like the department stores and everything. This was kind of the, the flavor that Brooklyn, that, that the Bronx had. You know, people worked in New York, they came back to the Bronx to shop and live. So that was the Bronx. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about this guy. This is Robert Moses. Have you guys ever heard of Robert Moses before? I, I, I thought David nodded, yes. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Robert Moses? Okay, Robert Moses is the architect, I call him the architect of isolation, that's my term, but he's the architect that designed all of the New York throughways. He designed the New York throughway going up to Albany, he designed it going all the way across New York State, and he designed all the interchanges in New York. So the Bronx um, Expressway, the Queens, everything getting around the islands to Staten Island. Um, he was involved in the Verrazano Narrows Bridge and other areas. So he designed what he called the Cross Bronx Expressway. Okay, so those of you that know your highway systems, <laughs> on the top where Route 1 is, is North Bronx. On the bottom is South Bronx. And then everything in between, 87 in the red. And if you go West 9, that is the George Washington Bridge. And then Hudson River to the West, and Nassau County to the east, and then Queens below. Basically, building this highway put a barrier 
between the neighborhoods, an actual physical barrier in between separating the neighborhoods, therefore exacerbating the discrimination. Here's a little aerial shot of um, the Cross Bronx. Okay. And as a result of this, there was a lot of demolition. They relocated entire neighborhoods. And if you were white, you were moved to the north. And if you were black, you were kind of forgotten about. So there was a lot of blight, therefore, that led to a lot of poverty and neglect led to riots and people burning buildings intentionally. It, it, it looks like a war zone. So these were the conditions that people were living in in the early 1970s. A lot of neglect, a lot of discrimination, all designed by Robert Moses. Okay, so these are the conditions in August of 1973. Enter a Jamaican immigrant by the name of DJ Cool Herc. DJ Cool Herc was a Jamaican DJ who, re who relocated from Kingston, Jamaica to the Bronx. Um, Kingston, Jamaica, by the way, is also the home of Bob Marley the home of Lee Scratch Perry, the home of Shaba Ranks, the entire Marley family. So there's a history already there. But Cool Herc was really much more into the funk and soul of American music. That was the height for him. Reggae was great as it was becoming an art form, but he was really much more into the James Brown and the instrumental music. And he was really moved by that. So that's what he would DJ on his sound system in Jamaica. When he moved to America, he brought that with him. He brought his love of American funk and um, Clyde Stubblefield and the James Brown drum breaks and would DJ over this and also toast, um, which is kind of like a Jamaican rapping, which would be like, hey, everybody, he'd get the party hype. He'd be like, hey, everybody, here we go. Oh, hey, we go with the show. Bum, bum, bum. And then he would play the song and people would lose their minds. So on August 11th, 1973, Herc hosted a back to school party for his sister, Cindy, in the rec room of 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. Now, obviously in the Bronx, if you have blight, if you have no money, no history, there's no bands to play. So the DJ was the hero. The DJ could get the party going. But DJ Cool Herc liked to play more instrumental music to keep the party going so he could toast and he can rap over it. So he invented what was called the break. He basically, and we're gonna see more about the break later. He basically would take instrumental breaks in the music where it was just drums and find ways to extend them. He would actually play them on one turntable and then have another copy of the same record on another turntable. And so when the break ended on this turntable, he would actually play on the other turntable, therefore extending the song as long as he needed it to be. And people lost their minds. So August 11th, 1973, I love this card. <laughs> this is the coolest. Um, this is the actual invitation to his sister's back to school jam. 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. 25 cents, ladies. <laughs> 50 cents, fellas. With special guest. School still out. I love it. I love this card. It's just like, it's so innocent, you know? He's just like, I'm just having a party, y'all. And here's, here's Herc with his two turntables. He was one of the first people to ever use two turntables. Being able to extend that break, extend the beat, keep it going. Keep the party going. Keep people dancing from 9 till 4 a.m. It is New York, after all. Herc was big in the sound systems. He would even drive around the Bronx with two giant speakers <laughs> and music playing as he's driving down the street. There's actually a video that you can look up of him driving down the street, just party to bring the party where it is. If it's in the park, if it's at someone's house, this was Herc's mode of operation. That's what he would do. So DJ Cool Herc is the father of hip hop. All right, so we're gonna move right into the music now. So the 1970s, 
Cool Herc, and a host of other DJs would start doing the same thing. Grandmaster Flash, um, Africa Bambada, and Grandmaster Kaz were some of the other DJs that would host these parties in the park. Maybe they were at someone's private, you know, private party, but the music was everywhere. And these guys were DJing all over the place. There were no real bands. And of course, there would be people who would be toasting or rapping in between the breaks. Um, this became what was known as the MC, the master of ceremonies. And they weren't really saying very much. They were basically, you know, getting the party hype. Hey, man, oh, she's dressed great. Oh, here we go. Wow, blah, blah, blah. what the show, playing basketball, you know, like <laughs> that kind of thing. But DJ Cole Herc had um, worked with um, an MC called Coke LaRock. And Coke LaRock was getting more creative with his lyrics. He was actually coming up with content. And he would repeat rhymes. He was the first person to ever say, throw your hands in the air. And people would lose their minds. Or everybody say, ho, came from Coke LaRock. He was the originator of that. So these two would go from party to party, very popular. Started doing clubs, as well as some of the other DJs. As well, groups started getting together because they started hearing about these MCs. So they started getting together in groups of MCs. This is Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five we'll talk about later. Um, they started to also host their own parties and make special appearances as MCs with DJs. Actually, Flash, who's all the way at the bottom left, was the DJ, and everyone else was an MC, and they would trade off. So they could go for hours. <laughs> they could go for hours, and they had flashy outfits. It was really kind of, they were really up and coming. Another group was an offshoot of some of the gangs that had um, that had um, formed in the Bronx. This is the Ghetto Brothers. They were also a group of DJ and MCs that would rock parties, as they would say. And of course, whoops, let's go back. I'm not done. Not done with these guys yet. We all know this name. Okay. Funniest part about this particular group, the Sugar Hill Gang, is that they were actually not from the Bronx. They're all from New Jersey because <laughs> they were hired by producer Sylvia Robinson to come in because they could rap in the recording studio. They weren't as raw as Grandmaster Flash or any of the other MCs who were really raw, um, raw in the parties with their content and everything. These guys were polished. They sounded good. They looked good. They were hired for looks. Matter of fact, Big Bang Hank, all the way to the left with the What's Happening hat on, um, actually, <laughs> actually rhymed someone else's rhyme. It was actually written by um, Grandmaster Kaz, who was an MC, had wrote the rhymes for Rapper's Delight, which was the first commercial hit in 1979. The other two wrapped their own rhymes. That's um, Wonder Mike and Master G. Oh, side note, I have a picture with Master G. I forgot to put it in here. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> so this is the Sugar Hill Gang. In 1979, they had the first commercially successful hip hop song known as Rapper's Delight. And there's a question in the quiz about that later. So remember that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the 1980s. Rap is now still edgy, but still about the party. Actually, it was still at the time called disco rap. That was the name because they rapped over dance beats. They rapped over instrumental breaks. And at the time, the music was disco in 1979. So lots of people called it disco rap. One of the first disco rap hits was Curtis Blows the Breaks. These are the breaks in 1980. Other groups of this time were the Treacherous Three. Whoops. The Funky Four Plus One, which was the first hip hop group ever to appear on Saturday Night Live in front of a national audience in 1981. And of course, Blondie with their hit Rapture. Um, who name checks um, an artist and entrepreneur named Fab Five Freddy, who was part of the hip hop scene in Bronx. And he was also part of the art scene in New York and part of the CBGB's punk movement. So for the fact that Blondie to tie into hip hop was really the beginning of a, a crossover to a wider audience. I'm not going to use the word mainstream. I'm going to say wider audience. Quick question. Yes. The picture you showed before that, um, is Jazzy Jeff Will Smith's Jazzy Jeff? Jazzy Jeff where? Which one? Uh, the Funky Four. No, this is not Will Smith's Jazzy Jeff. This okay. is a different Jazzy Jeff. <laughs> yes. There, there are lots of 
and you'll see it later. There's lots of rappers that have the same name because, you know. <laughs> um, let's see. Grandmaster Flash and the Furies 5 in 1982 released a song called The Message, which took hip hop from the party vibe and wave your hands in the air to talking about the conditions in the Bronx. Because even though people were loving hip hop and it was becoming part of, you know, everyday culture and even though it's so controversial, they didn't want the message to be lost. Um, oh, by the way, we're still suffering here. Here's the conditions in the Bronx. And it changed the entire sound of hip hop. Um, another song that came out at the time was Africa Bombada's Planet Rock, which also changed it more towards an electronic sense. But the message to this day is still the number one song in hip hop because it brought socially conscious messages about the conditions, the living conditions that everyone had to suffer through in the Bronx in 1982. Next is the Def Jam years, Def Jam Records. Def Jam Records was a record label started by Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons. And they put a little harder edge as a result of Grandmaster Flash and Furious Fives, The Message. Um, this is Run DMC, where the performances were much more ultra masculine and loud with loud brazen drum machines and rock guitars and really kind of started to change the, the sound of hip hop a little bit to be a little bit more brazen. Um, versus the disco. Then there's LL Cool J, another rapper, a bragger, if you will, <laughs> who, bought, who brought more of the bragging into hip hop, talking about his skills, talking about how big his radio is, <laughs> and talking about, you know, his performance skills, his prowess. Um, and he really kind of brought that more so into hip hop. Oops. And also in 1980s were the Beastie Boys, the first white hip hop group to have commercial success. Yes, Jeff says he puts his hands up. Yes, the Beastie Boys, who started off with kind of a frat boy image, but later on went to actually have hip hop credibility as sampling came in, which we will talk about later. Um, and of course, Def Jam ends the decade in the 1980s with the socially conscious and black power messages of Chuck D and Flava Flav, public enemy. Again started a ship we started to get from the disco rap and party music to socially conscious and yes there was still some party stuff going on but the messages started to change by the time public enemy came out in 1987 88 and 89 the, the country was a powder keg and these guys were talking about these issues that hadn't changed since the civil rights era so to this day of that, yes i had a question about the social consciousness of it how yes. Phil Scott Heron is one of my favorites. How did yes. he, did he, well, I guess I should say, did he help pave the way for some of the socially conscious works that we would see in the 70s and 80s? Yes, he did. Absolutely. He is a direct, direct influence on Chuck D. And you can look up Chuck D interviews. He cites two people, Gil Scott Heron and all of his albums in the 70s which were very socially conscious and very pro-Black and very pro-independence. <clears throat> and The Last Poets who would rap over African beats and African drums and djembes and Afro-Cuban music. So Last Poets and Gil Scott Heron, absolutely. And if you listen to Public Enemy, his, his timbre, his voice timbre is very similar to Gil, Gil Scott Heron. Um, good question, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, cool. I love Gil, Gil Scott Heron. I was in our house all the time as well as Rapper's Delight. All right, 1990s. Now that we're moving into more socially conscious and my t-shirt. <laughs> cool. Um, MTV, which had been invented in 1981, really primarily played rock music. Um, even with the Michael Jacksons and the Prince of the World, they still played primarily rock and pop music for those audiences. Um, but by 1988, they really couldn't ignore the fact that hip hop was a growing art form. So they created a show called Yo MTV Raps. And this show would feature all the up and coming artists, all the current artists, all the hot artists. They would come and actually rap and freestyle, which is basically rapping with no intention. It's improv improvisational rapping. They would come on the show and it really became um, the bellwether for hip hop. Um, anyone who wanted to be known had to go on Yo MTV Raps. Sadly, it only lasted seven years. Um, by the mid-90s, the show would pretty much kind of, um, and MTV in general, kind of <laughs> went through the path of playing less and less music and more and more programming. 
Um, but Yom TV Raps was really what made hip hop stars as large as they were, including this group, who I will not name. <laughs> we'll just call them NWA. I think we know what it stands for. Um, they brought a socially conscious message of the living conditions on the ground in Los Angeles. No party messages. They talked about everything. Unfortunately, they also talked about you know their feelings about police and police brutality because LA at the time, and this is before Rodney King. Um, <laughs> this is before Rodney King. This is late 80s, early 90s. They were talking about the conditions to let people know what was happening. Um, they did an interview on Yo MTV Raps where they drive Fab Five Freddy of Blondie fame <laughs> and of the art world around Los Angeles showing the conditions. And people were watching this for the first time on national television. No one had an idea that Compton, Los Angeles was so rough. They also showed off their rifle collection and kind of gave themselves an image as the world's most dangerous group as a result. After NWA imploded, because <laughs> by 1991, 92, they had kind of went their separate ways for various reasons. Dr. Dre, the producer of NWA and a young rapper named Snoop Dogg, um, joined up with an, um, let's see, how should I put this? Joined up with a gangster, basically, <laughs> named Suge Knight. And they started a label called Death Row Records. And Death Row's first two albums, Dr. Dre's The Chronic and Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style were the two biggest selling albums of 1992 and 1993, respectively. Um, it would cement gangster rap as one of the dominant forces in hip hop. Not that the East Coast was done, because we're going to talk about that in a second. But for a couple of years, the sound of West Coast hip hop, which was all sampled, we'll talk about samplers later, from George Clinton in the 70s, um, with messages of gangster rap and hardness, kind of like LL Cool J, but with a much, much more laid back style. <laughs> um, and yeah. Yeah, so this is Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. On the East Coast, however, there was a renaissance. There was a Black Pride renaissance as a result of Public Enemy bringing social consciousness and Black social consciousness back to the music. Um, groups like De La Soul, groups like Tribe Called Quest, who had very Afrocentric lyrics and jazzy deliveries, started sampling early jazz music of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And we'll talk about, again, we'll talk about sampling later, but the music became very rich as this result, as opposed to the G-Funk and the gangster rap of, of the West Coast. It was much more of a jazz-based art form. If you listen to it, you can really hear the jazz influence in a lot of the samples. Um, and a quick shout out, I gotta read this actually, hold on one second. And a quick shout out to Queen Latifah and all of the female rappers of the 90s. Yes, Queen Latifah, Moni Love, MC Light, Sister Soldier, The Real Roxanne. Um, women became um, also known for their lyrical uh, and um, their lyrical content and female empower empowerment messages in the 1990s. So shout out to them, little aside. And then by the mid 90s, the music is getting a little harder. The messages are getting a little more real and we have Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac Shakur. Notorious B.I.G. is more of an MC. He's an improvisational rapper. He can have a beat and rap on the fly. Tupac Shakur is more of a poet and talking about social issues and other personal issues and then kind of went gangster rap towards the end of his life. They were both unfortunately gunned down. Tupac Shakur is gunned down in 1996 and um, Notorious B.I.G. was Notorious B.I.G. was gunned down in 1997 as a result of the beef that happened between East Coast and West Coast um, for dominance in the hip hop genre. So by 1997, there was a giant void left and there were tons of imitators, tons of people who tried to capture their sound and their image, but nothing really ever stuck. The cool part about that is it led to more experimentation. Enter an artist, Busta Rhymes, and enter Missy Elliott, who started to experiment with images, both futuristic, both kind of 
Afrocentric <laughs> and Afrofuturistic. This is where this has started to permeate the music. And not only that, but a lot of other people started experimenting. A lot of our people, other people started realizing, you know what? We don't have to be gangster rap. We don't have to be jazzy. We don't have to do this. We can actually start to make the music that is a little bit different. Missy Elliott is from Virginia. Buster Rhymes is actually from Long Island. <laughs> And their sounds were very different, very futuristic, very different flows. The wordplay really started to grow and speed up. If you ever listen to Busta Rhymes, he is a very, very quick delivery, one of the fastest rappers on the planet. And then by the end of the 1990s, enters Marshall Mathers from Detroit. Detroit is more known for its disco and its house music, not really known for hip hop all that well. And Eminem, produced by Dr. Dre after he left Suge Knight and Death Row, <laughs> created his own sound, started to mess with the wordplay, unfortunately very controversial. Um, he left nothing sacred, even himself. He would throw everyone under the bus and then drive the bus over himself, <laughs> basically with lyrical content that was very controversial at the time. But the great part about moving into the, into the 2000s is that hip hop had no boundaries. It had no one particular sound. It's a beautiful thing if you go back and listen to 2000 hip hop. And I'm sure that many of you know many of the songs that came out in the 2000s. It's very diverse. You had Jay-Z who with Kanye West would actually sample music from the 70s and speed it up or pitch it down or change it and had his own delivery. We had The Roots, which actually had a live band featuring Questlove and a rapper named Black Thought at the bottom there. Um, they weren't afraid to experiment with instruments that were from other countries and Afro beats and old soul records and classical music. Meanwhile, having an MC as their leader with a live keyboard player and a tuba player, I might add. If you've ever seen The Roots, they have a tuba player. So they weren't afraid to experiment and they were very successful as a result. Dre and Snoop had a resurgence in the early 90s. Dre created an album um, um, called Dre Day, not Dre Day, I'm sorry, Dre 2001. And it was kind of a resurgence of the gangster rap. You'd be like, oh, we're still here too. We have all this other stuff, but we're also here. And it was very successful. We have Latinx. Is that right? Latinx? Latinx rappers Big Pun and Fat Joe, who represented the Bronx as well, bringing the Bronx back into the conversation, but with a more Latinx flavor. They would rap in English and Spanish as well. Um, unfortunately, Big Pun unfortunately died in, I want to say, 2005. Um, then we have Kanye West, who made wearing Argyle sweaters and being a nerd from college cool, <laughs> as well as being one of the most prolific producers of that time. Um, his first album, The College Dropout, changed the sound of hip hop, made it okay to be a little nerdy. <laughs> then we have Outkast. Um, Southern rap started to make quite an impact in the 2000s. Um, other um, producers like Jermaine Dupree and Master P from No Limit Records, New Orleans, the South really made, really made an impact in the early 2000s as well. Sounded very diverse, different wordplay with Southern twang which had never really entered the hip hop vernacular at that time. And they were very successful. They were the most winning um, hip hop group in 2004. They won a ton of Grammys and then didn't do anything ever again. So <laughs> then we have not only the South, but we have a style of music called Crunk um, created by uh, a producer named Little John. He's still active to this day. And that's his style of music. It's a club based music. It's very loud, very brazen. If you know the song, yeah, by Usher, that's Crunk. If you've ever heard that song before and little john is still very active right now and of course we have virginia's timbaland who produced Aaliyah. we mentioned baby girl earlier <laughs> timbaland is a producer responsible for many many hits in the 2000s with a very unique sound yes he sampled babies and crickets and weird weird out there futuristic sounds and so the beauty of the 2000s hip-hop is that there was no one track there was not just a run DMC. There wasn't just a Sugar Hill Gang. There wasn't just um, an NWA or Public Enemy. There was room for everybody. And it's a really exciting, exciting decade for that reason. Remind me, did Missy Elliott and Timbaland, didn't they work together? 
Oh yes, they they that was their first their first co collaboration. Right. Timbaland, thought- yeah. Timbaland's um, his entry was Missy Elliott's first album, yeah, Super Duper Super Duper Fly. Yeah, her wordplay, by the way, I would argue is the best wordplay of modern times. I would agree. <laughs> She's such a poet. She's so much fun. I love mm-hmm. Miss Elliott. Okay. And now we get into our modern times. Um, and at this time, the 2000s are kind of a weird time in music. Most rock and pop musicians were crying broke and crying foul because of file sharing and MP3s. And the fact that we could get music on these lovely devices and not have to go buy them at the record store anymore. So the rock musicians who were used to the major label system the way it was in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and leading into the 2000s, weren't able to sell records. Hip hop, on the other hand, which is used to adversity and used to having to find ways to create and get their stuff out there, um, embraced it and created what was called a mixtape. Now, mixtapes used to be cassettes, but then they became MP3s that were downloadable on file sharing sites and sh- sites like SoundCloud and um, MySpace. Remember MySpace? <laughs> and many of the artists that you see in these pictures were very successful as a result of doing features on other people's albums and releasing their songs straight to the fans. Artists like Drake, artists like Nicki Minaj, Kendrick Lamar. Future, Trippy Red, Extent, Extentacion, and Travis Scott, who unfortunately, Extentacion, this guy in the center, is now passed away in 2018. He was killed tragically a few years ago. Um, but they all were able to take advantage of that technology. I know I'm not trying to get into technology yet, but their music reached the height. So they were able to sell records and do tours and be very well known as a result. And they're all still very active today. Kendrick Lamar just released an album a month ago. Um, Trippy Red has an album coming up pretty soon. Drake just released an album not too long ago. And their sounds are variations, you know, variations on traditional hip hop with ambient sounds. Some of them are a little low fidelity. Some of them are acoustic guitars. They run the gamut of sound. And that is really where I'm going to sum up the evolution of the music of hip hop because now the music of hip hop has been influenced by other things in our culture, in our music. And when you listen to it, it will be very traditional. It's still very rhythm based, but will vary in sound. Okay, and speaking of rhythm, (laughs) let's get a little bit into the technology. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about the breaks. We're gonna watch DJ Cool Herc that we talked about that had the party on August 11th, 1973 explain how he extends the beat so here we go dj cool Herc. one night i went to the record to play out i said i wonder if i put that to myself i said hmm, if, if they're waiting for this particular break and i have a couple more records that has got the same break up in it i wonder how would it be if i put them all together and i told them i said i'm going to try something new tonight I'm going to call it a merry-go-round. Herc's merry-go-round meant that instead of playing whole records, he would play just the instrumental breaks, mixing between them to create a continuous dance rhythm. I started out with the dog. Lean back, dance around, clap your hand, stomp your feet. That part right there with the break, boom, I had to come up with bongo rock. No, 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 no vocals in it. Then I will go into Baby Yui, you know, the Mexican. And it was like, whoa, I think we got some hit, you know, because people was like, oh, whoa. Everybody was like, yeah, 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 I'm feeling this. Oh, yeah, 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 you know. So that is Herc 
explaining that very quickly. We're just going to watch a quick second of someone actually doing breakbeats live. What we're going to do right here is go back, way back, back into time. I'm going to fast forward just a little bit here. want to see it. You want to see it? Do you want to see it? Do you want to see it? Do you want to see it? I'm going to do it for you. 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 I'm getting red, 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 We all know that beat, right? <laughs> That's Bob James. Start the record all over again and you scratch on the other one. <laughs> and this goes, the party goes on and on and on. And then someone could just rap and toast over it. And yeah, it left space, which was wonderful. Okay. I think we already watched these. Let's get out of here. And now after the turntables, after the MCs was the invention of the drum machine which really changed the idea of having to have the breaks. You could actually program your own rhythms that you could rap over. If you know the song Planet Rock by Africa Bambata, then you'll know this first drum machine. This is the Roland TR-808, which was invented in 19, 1979 and ceased production in 1981. <laughs> it was not a hit, but now it is the most sought after drum machine. I looked up one. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll get one. They are $8,000 now. It's ridiculous. Um, but what I'd like to do very quickly is to actually demonstrate to you guys how to make a quick beat on an 808 drum machine. So I'm going to pull up. The beauty of now is that they have emulators that are free. So I'm going to try and recreate the Planet Rock beat for you in just a moment. Let's see. And this is based upon, um, I'm not sure if anyone's a musician here, but this is based upon slicing up 16, um, 16th notes and then placing them. It's called a step recorder. It's actually a little bit complicated to get started on. Let me know if you can hear this. We get our kick drum first. We got our our clicky hi hats. And a little snare drum. Actually, that sounds more like jam on it. Dum 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 which is the 808 drum machine. <laughs> so you know the sound. And the coolest part about this drum machine is that you could actually tune the drums a little bit which made it a little more flexible to use than just using turntables. So, again. so Jamie, is this a yeah. free app that you're just using right yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, this is a free app. This is io808.com, where you can actually use what is basically a Roland TR-808. You can program it however you want. So this was the, this was the sound of the early 80s. And then... And then people tended to use that. And then there were other drum machines that came out. There was another. <laughs> I love it. BG started purring to the rhythm. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, there were other drum machines that came out. There was another drum machine called the DMX drum machine, which I'll show you guys in a second. The DMX drum machine was the sound of the song King of Rock and everything that Def Jam Records did. Actually, let me play that one for you. You probably know this song. This is the DMX drum machine. It was the first drum machine that used actual drum samples, drum sounds. And therefore was a bit more flexible. You could tune it up. You could tune it down. I'm the king of rock. There is none higher. Sucker MCs should call me 
it's a bigger sound. You must choose fire. I won't stop rocking till I retire. Now we rock the party and come correct. All cuts are on time. Like that snare drum is just a massive sounding snare drum. And other rappers can't stand us, but give us respect. I challenge you to go and listen to early 80s, like Run DMC, and hear how many times you hear that drum machine, like between the Beastie Boys and LL Cool J and all the Def Jam artists. I think they all borrowed the same one because <laughs> they were also very expensive at the time. Okay, so moving on from the DMX drum machine into the 90s, the dominant drum machine was called the SP-1200. Yes, yes, yep, recognize that in the Beastie Boys. Very nice. All right, so let's go back into here. Okay. And this drum machine is called the SP-1200. It would allow you to record your own actual samples into it for the first time. Um, and this is the holy grail of drum machines for, for hip hop producers. Because of a weird reason, <laughs> it's very lo-fi. Part of, part of the idea of sampling albums, and we'll talk about samplers in a second, is the idea that it sounds old, that it sounds classic. And some of the newer drum machines like the DMX and the Roland TRO-8 are very crisp. They're very new sounding. This drum machine had such a roll resolution that it sounded old. So people loved it because it sounded like old James Brown beats. So I'm gonna demonstrate this drum machine for you very quickly. Again, they gracefully have made an emulator, so I don't have to spend eight thousand dollars. You could actually add your own samples. You could play into it or sample albums. So you get the idea. So here we go. Let's record something real quick. It helps if you're a drummer just a little bit. <laughs> ah, I messed up. Gotta erase that. There it is. Okay, good. That's good enough for now. And then we can add the guitar on top. It's starting to sound like hip hop, doesn't it? <laughs> If anyone knows the producer, Jay Dilla, this was his drum machine. Yes, David's nodding his head. He's like, yes, I've heard of Jay Dilla. This is the drum machine that he loved and used. So, okay. And then the other drum machine, and I just realized I don't have that in the picture, is um, the Akai, M oh, I do actually, hold on. The Akai MPC series. And actually, that's why, because Q-Tip, from the Tribe Called Quest is actually shown holding it on this album cover. This allowed the user to have even more control than the SP-1200. You could sample anything. It had a visual editor, so you could see a sound waveform and chop it up where all of the little hits are and assign them to different pads. So as whereas the other one had eight pads, this one has 16. So it give you more control. So you, you could really play it like an instrument. And if you ever look up, um, there's a there's a, 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 a beat maker and a producer named Da Vinci that actually plays this live. And it's incredible what he does of chopping everything up and playing everything. It's incredible. And it's still in production today. The other drum machines that you've seen, they've gone back into production, but they're $8,000. This one is still in production and still affordable for the average hip hop producer. Okay, moving on to the sampler. 
The idea of a sampler, and there's a picture of one here. The idea of the sampler is that you can take any audio source and create a digital copy of it and then manipulate it. You could plug in your turntable and play a piece of an album and put it in your song. You could take your own voice. You can take whatever you want. You can take a TV, you can plug it in and you can actually add it to your music. So sampling actually opened up creativity within hip hop in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, and now. But the problem is, is copyright. Is taking someone else's album, taking someone else's physical creation that actually has copyright and reusing it. So the battle with hip hop in the late 80s and early 90s really became one of, well, should we use this? Should we compensate Bob James for the sample that we used? Um, there's albums like Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique and De La Soul's Three Feet High and Rising, which came around around the same time. And they were sued by at least 15 different artists because they had so many little samples and Public Enemy as well. They had so many different pieces of different people's songs, kind of like a DJ, but even smaller bits. They tried to hide them, but they couldn't. And as a result, it's very expensive nowadays to actually put samples into your music. But people should still experiment, art still, should still grow, and people still use it. They just got better at hiding samples or they just pay, <laughs> basically. But samplers are really cool. I'm not going to demonstrate the samplers because of time. But just imagine that you take your voice, you take a piece of music, you can snip it, you can cut it, you can put it in a rhythm, you can manipulate it at that point. Okay. File sharing and the mixtape. We talked a little bit about Drake and Nicki Minaj and their ideas of being able to promote themselves through giving their music away for free on the internet and gaining millions of followers as a result. File sharing in the mixtape really changed hip hop because it let it spread without the need for mass media, without the need for anyone to have to know who you are. As long as you have a great lyric like Nicki Minaj or even Missy Elliott, and you have a MySpace page or you have a SoundCloud page or you're on a file sharing site, you can get that music for free and then get excited. Drake and Nicki Minaj used this to great effect. They didn't even release an album for the first six years of their careers. They basically just either gave music away or were on other people's songs. So by the time they released a proper album, they had millions of followers. There are still rappers to this day, and the term SoundCloud rapper is a used term. You hear it a lot in the music world. Uh, the idea that they're putting out these songs for free to gain attention. Other artists actually, not in hip hop, have actually used this. Billie Eilish. Um, let's see, who are some of the other names I saw? There were um, lots of other people who got famous as a result of MySpace and SoundCloud and file sharing. And the last piece of technology is this lovely invention <laughs> called AutoTune. We all know what AutoTune is. Have we heard it? Is it annoying yet to you? <laughs> David's smiling. <laughs> I see him. Not everyone might know what it is. Okay. AutoTune is basically a musical algorithm that corrects your pitch in real time so if you're not the greatest singer if you sing something that's a little off key the software will actually put you into the proper key um it's kind of fun <laughs> it's kind of fun to use i've used it a couple of times um but it has a surprising history this gentleman dr andy hildebrand is a phd he was a research engineer in the oil industry he designed an algorithm that could detect oil based upon seismic data, basically the same data they used to predict earthquakes. They were using to predict where oil would be. So he, cre he created an algorithm. He created a program for it. He discovered that this program would also work well with musical pitch. And in 1998, there was a song by the singer Cher called Believe that was the first to use this software to take the pitch and correct it. But the difference is you can actually have a slow correction or you can have a fast correction of that pitch. Say like you hit a note, you're like, uh, and you go up, it would actually correct that pitch quickly. That's the effect we know as auto-tune, which was made more famous by this gentleman right here <laughs> by the name of T-Pain. He is a great singer, by the way, and a rapper and a producer. 
but he used it on a bunch of R&B songs in the early 2000s and rappers took hold. Music that normally wasn't known for um, pitch, now you could have pitch. Kanye West, who we talked about earlier a little bit, released an album called 808s and Heartbreaks in 2008, where he is using autotune in every song and actually makes it more melodic. He made melodic hip hop as a result, and he's not a singer. And then Lil Wayne, this rapper, this guy right here, tried to do the same thing, but it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. So autotune is still present today. Rappers still use it right now to give themselves a sense of pitch and also to be a little futuristic because it's very futuristic sounding to have your pitch change very quickly. You can even sound like a chipmunk if you want to in real time. Okay, that's it, folks. Basically, I have, well, and as I get back into here, we're not going back to the 90s. No, no. <laughs> For culture, I would like to give you guys a quiz before we go. Is that all right with you? And test your hip hop knowledge because hip hop, the point of all of this is that hip hop has grown so much. It's become an everyday part of our lives. Someone just mentioned that there is a song that they didn't realize was hip hop was hip hop. That's the power of its infusion into our everyday culture. There's phrases that we use that we don't even realize were from hip hop. Has anyone ever said the term off the hook? Like, oh my God, that's off the hook. That's a hip hop term. Um, ever enjoy a remix? That's a disco and hip hop thing. Um, came from the 1970s. If you've ever seen the movie, The Wedding Singer, have you ever laughed when the grandma raps Rapper's Delight? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> she knew Rapper's Delight. Um, find it normal that Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart are doing commercials together. <laughs> Sunny, I love Sunny's face. Yes, it's normalized. It's, it's wonderful that it's so prevalent in our everyday lives. Um, ever, call, ever call someone a homie? What's up, homie? That's a hip hop term. Um, ever call something whack? Oh my God, that's so whack. <laughs> that's a hip hop term as well. I was in the music. All right, so what I'd like to do is give you all a quiz. Let's see how we do. And we're, we're gonna wrap up with this today. So here's a quick quiz, 10 questions and a bonus question. All right. What is the name of the primetime sitcom starring Will Smith in 1990s? Circle gets the square. Jeff. Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That's absolutely right. It is a Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yes. <laughs> Primetime sitcom. Very nice. Starring Will Smith. Excellent. Next question. What does the word for, shiz for shizzle mean? <laughs> Sorry, I can't pronounce this. What does the word for shizzle mean? For real. For real? Okay. You get bonus points. Yes. Is for real, for sure, or for certain? You can use it in any of those. And the, th the great thing about hip hop is that words have multiple meanings, <laughs> which is really cool. So, very yes. nice to give that to me. Thank you. <laughs> yes. For real. For shit. For real. For shizzle. Yeah. <laughs> for shizzle. <laughs> for shizzle. <laughs> what song does Rapper's Delight sample? Good times, chic. Yes. Yes. Yes, David. <laughs> yes. Good times, chic. And when you listen to the two, it's a pale compared. It's a pale version of it, by the way. It's not quite as <laughs> intricate as Chic with this with the strings and everything. It was just three guys in the studio. Which side note, my dad did not play on. He played on everything after that. Um, okay, name the group that performs the song "Push It." And if you need a hint, they were in a Geico commercial recently <laughs> to show Salt you. And Salt, Salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. Yes, Salt David. Pepper. Yes, Salt and pepper. That's right. <laughs> That's right. They're pushing along more. <laughs> That's how much hip hop is a part of our culture. <laughs> They're pushing a lot more and selling insurance. All right. Here we go. Name one breakdancing move. Moonwalk. Moonwalk. Yes. Moonwalk is a breakdancing move. And anyone yeah. name any others? Who is the worm? Yes. Ah, the worm is a word. Yes. Can we get one more? Backspin. Backspin. There you go. We got it. Excellent. Windmill, <laughs> pop and lock in. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's very nice. Cool. Who's Beyonce's husband? Jay-Z. Jay there. Jay. That was an easy one. Uh, you all know who Jay-Z is. Great. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> all right. Name the 90s term for shiny, ornate jewelry. Oh, 
Bling. Bling. Yeah. yeah. All right. You guys are like scoring 100. Man, this is great. Bling or bling bling as it was first known. Who performed during the Super Bowl this year? Everyone awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Eminem, Kendrick Millar, Millar, Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> Dr. Yep. Dre. Dre. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Oh, I forgot to put Kendrick in there. But yeah, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, 50 Cent, Eminem, Mary J. Blige, and Kendrick Lamar. Sorry, Kendrick. Forgot to put you in there. All right. But yes. Finish this lyric. Mo money. Mo problem. Mo problem. Mo problem. Yes. <laughs> How many yeah. times have you said that? <laughs> Too many. Too, Too many, many times. <laughs> exactly. I still want more money, not to lie. Yes. Oh, but who doesn't? <laughs> what does the word, and these are interchangeable, what are the words cheese or guap mean in hip hop? It's a little harder. Money. Money. Yes. Cash. Money. Yes. Cash. Money. Nice job, David. Very good. Do you know what guap stands for? No. George Washington on paper. Oh. <laughs> yes. So when someone says, yeah, I got to get more guap, that's what they're talking about. Okay. Also, dead presidents. Yeah, just, yeah the movie. Yep. Yeah. Cream, yeah, the movie. Cream. And people still say that. I need some dead presidents. So. Money. All right. Bonus question. What does the term OG mean? Original, original gangsta. gangsta. Yes. Original gangsta. original gangsta. How do we know all of these? Because hip hop is a part of our everyday lives. It's a part of our everyday language, our everyday culture. We know it. It's part of us. That was the whole point of this. <laughs> so thank you all very, very much for listening to me thank go on you. and on and on about hip hop. And um, I hope that you go and maybe listen to some of these artists again. You know, maybe go and watch a documentary. There's a ton of great documentaries. Triple um, X Tentacion has a new documentary about his life that just came out. There's a Kanye West genius documentary. There's Wild Style, which is about dance and graffiti. There's... Um, there's B-Boy, and we didn't talk about B-Boys or dance at all, but mm. there's a ton. Of, there's the um, Hip Hop Evolution series on Netflix. Please go and visit all of these. Please know more, and we will continue to watch hip hop grow and evolve and change. Thank you. Jamie, do you want 